everyone, we're back with another episode of The Artiste with Ivy Reese, and my name is Ivy Reese, and today's guest is Sheila Tucker. She is an artist and the event coordinator and host of Poetry and Prose event in Oakville, and today we will be talking about a very important topic, the cultural appropriation of art. Uh, Sheila has traveled the world, uh, she's been an artist on and off for 20 years as a writer and a painter. And uh, we're gonna be exploring a very important issue that especially affects us in, the in this cultural melting pot that is the 905 and the GTA. Sheila emigrated to Canada uh, just about 30 years ago from the UK. And she has traveled to and worked in Israel, Hong Kong, Spain, Iran, Belgium, and other places. She regularly visits museums in Europe and in North America. And uh, we're going to start off by talking about some of your views on Sheila. Thank you for on art. Thank you for okay. joining us, Sheila. Thank you. So I know that when we were speaking a few days ago, you told me one of the things you liked about how art being uh, represented in museums in Europe was that there were a lot of art pieces on many walls, whereas in yeah. North America, you yeah. noticed a trend where art will tend to take up its own space on a wall. Well, yes. Uh, when I first came here, it was 1985, and I remember going to you know, the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario, for the first time and seeing a big, bare, expansive wall with one painting on it, just one. And I'm thinking, are they in the middle of, you know, changing an exhibit? <laughs> but I actually realised that this was how many of the galleries here are laid out. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just a different approach. But um, it was, it's very different. It was something I wrote home about, actually. Oh, over here, the art galleries are very different. You know, they have three, maybe four paintings on one huge wall, as opposed to, in Europe, many of the uh, art galleries, for example, the National Gallery in London or the, uh, the really? National Portrait Gallery in London, they have like a collage of many from, not from floor to ceiling, but from floor to shoulder length, uh, uh, so many uh, paintings and you can just look from one to the other um, as opposed to just one or two on one wall so I found that very different when I came here not and I'm not talking how? in a huge generalization nothing is absolute the Tate Modern for example might take after the AGO uh, but how for the most part how do you think that affects the viewers experience when you're looking at the piece of art on the wall when there's a collage well, to contemplate versus a solo piece and I also understand you said there's one room in the AGO that has uh, that kind of represents it, this it multiple, does. Yes, multiple it's on, arts on one wall. It's on the second floor, and it's made as a replica of a 19th century art gallery. It's, it's exactly what I just described. All the paintings are framed. You know, there's a Robert Peel there, you know, after the bath. Those two children, it's a famous painting. Yes, oh, I know there. that one. Uh, and there's, there's many, and they're just everywhere. Some up here, down here, and so on, all the way around. And I can spend, you know, so long in that gallery because what I find in answer to your question is that um, perhaps one argument is that when you've only got one painting on a wall or perhaps one line, one single line of paintings on a wall in an art gallery, it gives you time to only focus on that one or that two and stand there and look at those. That's fine, but, you know, most of us are able to do that mm -hmm. without needing to have all this bare expansive wall. Uh, sometimes you can feel a little gypped if you go into a museum and all you see is just a few paintings when you could be seeing a lot. Because what I find is that when I'm in a gallery with you know, a lot of paintings on the wall, I tend to just, one will catch my eye first, depending on my mood. Maybe this one over here, a pastoral depiction. So I'll well, be looking at that, I'll be staring at that for a while. All the others just go out of my mind and I'm looking at that one. And then I eventually I can switch to another one. And then eventually another one. So you're in there longer and you're yes. gazing at more paintings. For me, I enjoy that more. Well, I think it's interesting how, you know, you look at Europe and and cultural appropriation, you know, obviously is across the board because mm -hmm. when you have multiple cultures coming together, we're all going to be influenced from the various art forms that we do see. Yes. And uh, North America being you know, the new land, the new world. Yeah. Uh, here, we've moved into kind of having the solar representation of an artwork in a museum, which a museum, in a way, in my opinion, is a, a, essentially a platform for not only displaying art, but it's, it's you know, it 
well, depending on the exhibit, you could say it appropriates art and for the point of exhibiting it. And therefore, I think it's interesting how, you know, here in the New World, we're showing it on the wall solo, whereas in Europe, they put meshing it all together, yet they still influence each other. And Well, I think that um, because, yeah, we talked the other day at uh, that Tanzac club yeah. that we were talking in, and uh, we were talking about appropriation, and various things came up, I remember. Um, when it comes to cultural appropriation, I know that's a hot topic here in Canada right now, yes. um, for various reasons, and some of them are very understandable. Uh, for example, the indigenous peoples here, they have been marginalized for many, many years. Uh, they feel that their icons and art has been appropriated by Caucasians, by uh, people in the West, uh, white people, and they feel that it's been stolen and their ideas have been stolen. Now, to an extent, I agree with them, and in other ways, I do not agree. For example, if it is something that is a religious, let's say a religious icon for the different in indigenous groups, um, it could be very, sa it is very sacred to them. It's, 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 it's historical, it's sacred, and it's very important so f for them to see other c communities take those icons and use them as kitsch or some trendy fashion. It's, uh, it upsets them. Well, it absolutely, and that brings us to, uh, you know, you just, I know you describe your paintings as primitivism. Yes. And they, they're quite influenced from African artworks and, and South Pacific. Yeah. And um, prehistoric and early European stuff. And we'll definitely show our yeah. viewers uh, in a moment okay, sure. some of your stuff. And, um, and, you know, so it's interesting because your work has been affected by the early, you know, the Crusades yeah. and all of that. Um, and that has a big impact on, on Western art. And uh, the tribal art was an important influence on Picasso, you were telling yes, me. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, in regarding his cubism. Absolutely. So that, yeah. and then that kind of bled over into modernism. Do you want to maybe yes. talk about, show yes. the viewers some of your, a couple of your pieces and talk about okay. how you feel? Uh, modernism over? and primitivism. Prim primitivism is basically, um, it could cover African tribal art, it could cover petroglyphs, you know, the Peterborough petroglyphs. Uh, it can cover prehistoric, historical um, artifacts that have been found and jewelry that have been found from prehistory in my country of Britain as well as you know what, all of us are from cave dwellers yes. and all of us uh, have a right to um, enjoy the artifacts that our ancestors created a long time ago. And when it comes to primitivism in um, human depiction, I mean, we all have two eyes, one nose and a mouth, so there are certain limited ways that we can depict that. Well, unless you're a genius like Picasso, where in his version of primitivism, which in his modernist yeah, he paintings, deconstructed he had an everything. eye over here, exactly he did, he had a mouth over here, he was just brilliant. Well my own, um, basically mine started when, after I got sick, I got very sick a couple of years ago, I ended up having four surgeries, uh, wow. life-saving surgeries, and uh, basically it was after that, about six months after that, that I started drawing faces, and these faces all had an emotion, and I realised that I was there were my own emotions coming out in these faces. So this one actually is the first one that I painted. I love that one. Her name is Malice. Yes. And she is, um, well, if you look at her, if you look at her eyes, you can see that her eyes are just slightly evil. Mm -hmm. If you look at her mouth, you know, her mouth is sultry, voluptuous, but there's something quite dark mm, about her. Mm, yes. It Malice is I, she represents the disease that tried to kill me a couple of years ago. Yes. Now I feel that I have locked her in this canvas and she's never going to get out. But I don't know, I'll never part and with have, her. And you delved into that primal aspect. I mean, some yes. people could look at that and say you've appropriated from African art. Yeah, one could. Except that I was not looking at any pictures, but I think, uh, I think something came Young. from inside yes, of you it did in come the same way me. we all came from the same but, place. Uh, like I said, you're going to do so many things with, you know, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. But 
it was Carl Jung that talked about archetypes mm -hmm. and how instinctual it is for humans to create faces and heads. You know, look at ancient uh, ancient Egypt. You know, with the depictions of, of faces. You look at. Um, you know, the, the, the Roman statues with the beautiful faces. Very instinctual to create faces. Faces are very powerful. But a lot of us have an urge to create faces. And in fact, in iconoclasm, um, the first thing that people will do if they're trying to destroy another culture, you know, during a takeover or war, they will destroy the faces on those paintings. You'll go and you'll see the paintings, the, the faces well, are out, or a statue, the head's been knocked off. It's because why? Because eye contact is very powerful. Faces are very powerful. They're the first thing to go during iconoclasm when, when people are rubbing out someone else's. So essentially, um, you're yeah. saying we can't we can't escape as human beings. Yeah. We cannot escape. It is part of us. Exactly. And then this one is this the one goddess. is uh, Janus. Janus. Another yes. one that I was uh, another one of my faces. Janus was actually a Roman god in Roman mythology way yes. back. Um, Janus was actually one head with two faces pointing in opposite directions and basically it represented beginnings and endings as mm -hmm. well as transitions and duality and my Janus is actually, he's, he's facing opposite directions too but he's looking at himself. Yes. So he's, this is, to me this is myself, yourself, himself reflecting on his past and how he wants to go forward in his future. So that's what I was um, creating with uh, this particular painting. So yeah, when it comes to, but we were originally talking about indigenous art and how it was being appropriated. I would like to talk about why I think their fears may be in some cases very valid. And I would and like I, to start with. Well, I think absolutely we'll get a uh, most certain, yes. but let's, before, before we go to a very important topic about the uh, origin of the swastika yes. and how that has been ha distorted, obviously, by the Germans yes. uh, during World War II, let me quickly bring up the Now Magazine article. Oh, yes, okay. Yes, and then we'll, we'll get further on, because that still relates to the indigenous topic. Uh, yes. Now Magazine, uh, some of you may have heard, ran uh, an, an article in May, uh, May, June of this year. Yeah. And uh, Jason Carter, who is a Cree Canadian uh, artist, did the cover for the article, and it was uh, decolonizing cannabis. Uh, now that cover on the Now Magazine issue uh, caused a lot of controversy. Uh, Jason Carter, the artist, had drawn a bear um, wearing a headdress with marijuana leaves as the headdress, and uh, there was a huge uproar. And uh, and. Now Magazine ran a secondary piece in response to the public's response yeah. and talked to, and Jason Carter explained that the bear is a symbol of success. Uh, often if you dream about it, you may have success in a hunt, birth of a child. Uh, the tribal headdress uh, can be given to anyone as a symbol who, in, within a tribe who uh, has shown leadership. However, the controversy in regards to decolonizing cannabis went because uh, marijuana leaves are not part of indigenous culture. Uh, although the indigenous uh, may smoke weed, it's not a part of their culture, uh, whereas tobacco has a very strong traditional connotation for them. I think many of us know that uh, indigenous peoples make up the largest proportion of inmates in the prison system, uh, despite being one of the smallest populations within Canada, and a, a lot of it is for small crimes uh, possession. So the decolonizing cannabis title touched on how perhaps uh, they can be freed from that and contextualization of art is always important, whereas for tobacco, uh, you know, they must abide by the non-smoking laws even though culturally tobacco is very important for them. So I think that really began a huge conversation along with uh, yes. you know, the, appro the appropriation prize, which we'll get yes. to in yes. a moment. Now, what are your thoughts on that? when it comes to indigenous art and fashion and braids well, and all of those issues were... I think some allusions to any culture in fashion is fine if they're alluding to, but when they're downright copying uh, certain fashions and whether it's for street fashion or whether it's for a costume party, some things are just a no-no. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the headdress is definitely out of bounds because even some indigenous tribes 
don't use the headdress. And for those, the, the indigenous societies that do have a headdress as part of their tradition, not all of the people in that society wear them. The, uh, the right to wear that is assigned only to certain people, whether it's elders, someone who's earned the right to wear the headdress, perhaps so, someone who's performed a social service or so responsibility to those. So for people like us, other people outside of their community, to wear the headdress, it's, uh, it, it, they find that insulting because even a lot of their own societies are not to wear them, just certain people. And that brings us to, uh, I know you have very strong views on if someone is going to appropriate art, uh, or in you know, appropriation as a very strong word, but even have their work be influenced by it, there's got to be uh, that we have to think about what we're doing and, and take a look at the history and tradi tradition behind yeah. sacred symbols. Yes. And one of the things that, ma that makes me think about is that a lot of if when we're talking about ancient cultures, almost everything was sacred and traditional, so it becomes very muddy uh, in that almost anything of sacred or old cultures, such as the Mayans, the indigenous peoples, the Egyptians did, were sacred, and whether they still exist or uh, whether that culture is still alive, in this case the indigenous peoples still exist, whereas the Mayan culture do not, um, it's very, or, or the Aztecs, it's very, it, you know, causes debate. Now, you had some interesting points to talk about in regards to swastika, the swastika and how that yes. was distorted. So yes. why don't you tell us a bit about the, the Jainism religion and all of that? Okay, yes, we did touch on that. And I said that um, this is why I think, again, that uh, appropriation of religious symbols specifically, not all are, it should be by a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, But religion, uh, it can be very dangerous. And the swastika is absolutely one of those things that was taken completely out of context. Now, I want to show How people... How old is this symbol and it's, the it's, Jainism it's religion? Thousand, oh, Tell our viewers old. a little bit about uh, the Jainism. Jainism is, uh, they are in India. Mm -hmm. the, a small group compared to, say, Buddhism, which has traveled to other countries. The Jains, Ahimsa is non-violence. That's one of their main slogans is Ahimsa, non-violence. And they're more peaceful than they the They are Buddhism. even more peaceful than the Buddhists. I mean, they will actually walk along the street with, sweep it, with sweeping brushes. And this is to sweep the ground in front of them so that they don't accidentally tread on an insect and kill it. If when they eat, they will only eat vegetables, but not root vegetables. They would never eat a carrot because they are killing the whole carrot. They will eat an apple because they're not killing the whole apple tree. So they would eat an apple. So they are super, super peaceful people. And what the, what the Germans did was they took their symbol. So the symbol uh, for the Jains, here is the symbol. As you can see, part of that symbol is a swastika. And this swastika is actually upright. What the Germans did was they tilted it uh, 45 degrees and they put it on a white circle within a red square. They made it their own, unfortunately, but the original but they swast it. Yes, absolutely. Literally. And, and look what they did. It. Now people in the West will look at this symbol and even if it is uh, Without the hand. Yeah, if, even if it's depicted like this, they're going to think of Nazi German unless they know who the Jains are. So this originally, this, 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 the arms of this uh, was representative of the four characteristics of the soul. So knowledge, perception, happiness, and energy. Yes. That's what these four arms represent. And what's interesting is also, speaking of how the Nazis distorted an yes. ancient symbol, yes. in, speaking of fa fashion, cultural appropriation, uh, for example, many of us obviously know Ch uh, Charlie Chaplin. And the you know this small mustache was a very common mustache up until Adolf Hitler had that mustache oh, yeah, yeah. and now nobody will wear it yes. and, and it's and it's true yes. I mean it, it, it's it's actually you, you do not see that mustache anymore where it was a, a normal yeah. style yeah. for one of the way a man can do sure. his face and uh, the other thing is is even the name Adolf which is a very old German name, a common name such as John is one of the most common yeah, names in the English language, is, 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 is no longer used. Uh, I'm from a German background, so I know even speaking in Germany with yeah. many people over the years, that it, it is a shame that you cannot even use that name anymore because, so not only were his fa yeah. uh, mustache could be mm -hmm. such as doing hair and braids, so yeah. he appropriate, you know, 
that, and although he wasn't appropriating it, he was using a common uh, style. Yes. That in itself yes. has been so uh, made so sordid. Do you know that in England and, after and the war? And same with the name as well. Yeah. His, his, like the name Adolf, which is was just yeah. a standard name. After the war in England, what you call German shepherds. They changed the name from German Shepherds in England. They called them Alsatians. So those oh, dogs yes. are now called Alsatians because after the war they were just so anti-German everything back then uh, because of you know the recent hurts of the war. So they became Alsatians, which they're still called to this day. And obviously, yeah. this is an important example about how we have to be careful because cultural appropriation does, and especially when in regards to art, it, it can go very far. And uh, that brings us, I want to talk a little bit about the KKK. Oh, yes, I'll talk about the And then we'll Kukus move Klan. into a little bit with uh, the controversy over uh, cultural appropriation again yes. with the crucifix. Yes, and then I mean, they burn the crucifix. You see them, the cultural, the, the Ku Klux Klan, you see them on TV. I don't want to be any closer than that, but they are <laughs> burning a crucifix. And to me, isn't this appropriation of the, one of the most important Christian symbols, the cross? And isn't the cross uh, and, and Christianity about love thy neighbor as opposed yes, to harming okay. black people? I mean, what's all this about? So I can tell you actually where that originated from, that burning of the cross. You know that It started with a very early 1900s movie by D.W. Griffith, and it was called Birth of a Nation. Yes, and it was basically glorifying the clan that uh, that movie. And at one point in that movie, there are some clansmen who have surrounded a black man, and they are they are accusing him. It's all in uh, silence, but it has you know the the wording, mm -hmm. and they're accusing him. And they the in, in the background, for some reason, there's this crucifix made of twigs, you know, trees and branches, and it's, it's a crucifix, and it's burning, the whole thing is burning. And the early Ku Klux Klan members looked that. at that, and they loved it. They thought, oh, this is great, we'll use this as a symbol. Even though it technically makes it no was, sense. I have no idea why D.W. Griffiths it, it, even put that in there, but it became one of the big symbols, and it's sick, it's really sick. So again, you can see why the indigenous people can be very upset that things might be taken, because there is this risk of things being misunderstood when they're taken out of their context. But I only think that is true of visual art, I do not agree with cultural appropriation when it comes to literature. Absolutely, and that brings us to the controversy with Hal Mietzvizik, a uh, former editor of the Writers' Union of Canada, who, incur who in May 2017 encouraged people to uh, explore the lives of people who aren't like you. Uh, there was such a huge backlash and, and counterattack from everyone for that comment that he promptly resigned yeah and uh, and he also penned the uh, penned an editorial piece about winning the appropriation prize where he argued that he did not believe in cultural appropriation in the context yes. of literature yes and for our viewers if they want to read more about this they can find the article on global news and I'll just uh, mention that right now and uh, global news May 2017 and I'll come back to the title in the title is called What You Need to Know About the Cultural Appropriation Debate. But you feel the same way in that with literature. I do feel the same way. And there's some notable books that we can also talk about. I mean, yes. I mean, uh, Putting s yourself in someone else's shoes is important. Absolutely. I mean, if, all we, if we were not allowed to write about people that were outside of our own cultures, I mean, my goodness. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin would never have been written. Yes, um, you know this. The and we should just what is Uncle Tom's ta ca Cabin for some of those who don't know? Well, just a it's, quick uh, it's a it's it's about it's black people slaves. You know the treatment of back then. Uh, she it was a very important book, and it's still to this day people s still read this book. It's it's very. And it was uh, written by Harriet Stowe, lady. Yes, Harriet and Beecher did, Stowe. It, yes. And it, uh, in 1852. Yes, it that's changed. right. He dies in the end. Uncle Uncle Tom dies in the end, but um, it actually they, this book is somewhat credited for sparking the Civil War absolutely. in America. Oh yes, which is huge, and she was an abolitionist. Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln met her one time, and he said, "So this is the little lady who started the war." 
<laughs> yeah, that's what he said. And so that shows the power, the power of cultural of appropriation work. because she put herself in the shoes of a black Okay, slave. but I don't think it was appropriation, you see. Neither do I, but for I the think point that, of the... uh, you see, I, when it comes to literature, I do not think that there is cultural appropriation. I think there is putting yourself in, each, in, in someone else's shoes. I think there is exploring issues. I mean, I think the reason there is sensitivity about this with regards to literature is because, unfortunately, in this country, uh, indigenous cultures have been silenced for so long, they have not been listened to, they have not been heard. Thankfully today, I mean, we've got people like Jeanette Armstrong, Eden Robinson, jo uh, Thomas Joseph, King. Joseph Boyden. Oh, uh, well. Well, he's... he's he, uh, th there's controversy as to whether he is actually from, uh, he, that he has indigenous blood or not. I, he, but, there uh, is, but he is a, a good, ex uh, so let's, for the sake of argument, I consider him a white person. Yes. And he has written amazing. This is what I've been. And, and he, yes, his, his exactly. pieces on exploring the indigenous world exactly. have been Canadian bestsellers. No I think the important words. thing, Ivy, is research. Like, there was a very famous book out in the mid-80s by James Clavell. Mm -hmm. It was called Whirlwind. Yes. And it was about the Iranian Revolution. That was the backdrop. There were fictitious characters, but it was the backdrop was the Iranian Revolution. I happened to be in Iran in 1978 and 79. I and saw it was the whole thing. In 79. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I read his book, I was so amazed at how much he got right about the way that people interact over there, about the food, about the culture, about so many things he got right. I thought, how can this guy know this? Why? Because he researched and he hired other researchers. He researched the backdrop, the backdrop so he got it exactly right. And I think that's the important thing. If we are going to write about other cultures, whether they are some indigenous society or aboriginals in Australia or or, or even not, even if it's about China or Japan or somewhere, we need to research to make sure that, 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 that our settings are correct. Yes. As for our protagonists, heck, you know, in every society we have social deviants as well as good people, as well as, um, you know, every kind of person. So our protagonists can be what we want them to be. So research is key in being informed and yes. sensitive. Yes. And I would say that whenever with even visual art and perhaps for sure with visual art but definitely sometimes with even literature prose uh, giving art artistic context is most important well here's the thing extent. i mean uh, jason carter who you just mentioned the cree yes. uh, artist well, who, he gave the context who thereafter. Gave in the now magazine the uh, the bear with the headdress, headdress. Um, he was not asked to resign from being an artist, was he? He was not told you can never paint another but picture. But he is a Cree Canadian. But if they're even arguing amongst themselves about what is right and what isn't, what chance do the rest of us stand? Absolutely. Like even the indigenous groups themselves do not agree on what is and what isn't acceptable. So how can the rest of us know? But he was not, he, he explained what he was doing and he has not felt the urge to uh, to, to resign. He is, uh, yet, yet Hal needs Vicky. I'm sorry, it's hard to pronounce. It Hal needs absolutely. Vicky. Uh, he I resigned. You know, Ken White resigned. Um, Jonathan Kay resigned. I don't think they should have. I think they should have stood their ground and said, this is what I believe. I believe that when it comes to literature, we have freedom of speech, we have intellectual freedom, we have freedom of creativity, artist, artistic expression. You cannot curb these things, not in a free country like ours. Absolutely not. I, think, I do think that at schools, they should be teaching children to be sensitive to cultures, such as that they teach religion, so they teach Judaism, Christianity, uh, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism. When do they teach about Indian um, and, and, and well, they're starting in, in to Inuit, in Inuit the, and uh, indigenous? Are. Good. I'm, it's, it's been, about in the last time. two years. It's been incorporated strongly into the curriculum. Good. Sure. Um, we've got to wrap up in just a couple minutes. Okay. Sure. But absolutely want to tell you about Sheila's event, and I uh, just want to say that you know, in regards to your last comment, uh, even uh, AM 980 host uh, Andrew Lawton asked, "Is cultural appropriation?" an act of theft or artistic literature exploration? And I think that's a great question for all of us to think about yeah. uh, as we move forward. And uh, Sheila will be starting up a blog uh, and you're upcoming, and I understand you're also uh, upcoming with a memoir 
and a, your first po uh, prose collection, and you will be a featurette artist with poetry and yes. visual art yeah. in the Artis 4 magazine issue that will yeah. be coming out September 30th. Uh, and you also have your up, uh, your poetry and prose event in Oakville kicks back off yes. in September. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your upcoming works, your blog, and how people can sign up uh, to get sure. on the list sure. and uh, your event. And well, new if features. people want to sign up to be on my poetry and poetry, poetry and prose uh, email list to be notified monthly about my events, it's uh, Oakville P and P at Proton Mail. Dot com and if you contact me there I can put you on my list and you will be notified and I have these events on different days of the week and at different times so that I can accommodate everyone because some people work at weekends they can't make it some people are taking evening classes they can't make an evening so I'm trying to accommodate so that everyone can make it at some point or another absolutely and in sept September 9th will be the next one from 2 to 4 p.m. and Rocco De Giacomo yes. will be the feature. Yes. On October 13th, Robert Priest, one of the top uh, literary characters in Canada, will be the feature. Singer songwriter. Absolutely. Poet, yeah. um, from 2 to 4 p.m. And then I think you have Paul Edward Costa on in December. I have Paulette, uh, uh, Paul Edward Costa in uh, December, and I have Mohamed Feta, who is an amnesty volunteer, in November. But again, and Paul I, Edward um, Costa, for those of you who don't know, was uh, nominated. Uh, for the uh, Emerging Literary Artist Prize at the Marty Awards this year in May. Uh, I saw him there at the awards ceremony. The artiste, got to tell you, was also nominated for creative design. And uh, Paul is a great poet, so he will be yes, there. Yes, he is. Yes. Yes. Can I make one more quick comment? Oh, of comment? course. You have to tell okay. me about your... Um, the memoir that I have finished, yes. finally finished, um, and looking for a literary agent, but basically... For those indigenous peoples who suffered through residential schools, uh, and they are still scarred by that. Yes. Um, in this memoir, which is about me, obviously, but it also touches on a lot of social issues, poverty, uh, um, lack of opportunities for women. But uh, I also, I was taken away at age four. I was just turned four, and I was taken away for a year um, and subjected to awful treatment and after a year my aunt rescued me and she took me to my grandparents but you know that year I was I was panic stricken I was uh, abused I was it was terrible and it really wrecked the rest of my childhood so these people who did go to residential schools I really really feel for them because I know personally that you don't recover from that except through hard personal work and that's what my memoir is about is well, about how to recover from that. And you have an upcoming blog that will and yes. come that be will starting be shortly. So about please that. email yeah. Sheila at the Oakville P and P at Proto and Proton ProtonMail dot com. That's it. Yeah. And uh, also join her Facebook group. What is it called? The, uh, for the Lit Cafe, or the Poetry and Prose Cafe? Poetry and Prose, is called Oakville Poetry and Prose, okay. that's what it's called. That's the PNP. Oh, okay. So Oakville PNP, Oakville Poetry and Prose. Perfect. Um, that's what it stands for. And yeah. she will get you onto the blog, and uh, you can reach out there and find out how you too can be a feature on the Poetry and Prose event. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you again. Thank you, Ivy. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thanks.